You are listening to 99.1 WQRT LP Indianapolis, and this is Create Here. Produced by artists and curators from Big Car Collaborative, Create Here is your place to listen to conversations with people making intriguing, innovative, and impactful things happen on the cultural front in Indianapolis, Indiana, and beyond. Find out more and access additional episodes at WQRT.org. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Create Here. I'm Mary Goodwin from Aurora Photo Center, an Indianapolis nonprofit dedicated to supporting visual artists working in photography through exhibitions, residencies, workshops, visiting artist talks, and access to creative tools. We are here with artist Lua Kobayashi, who is in Indianapolis for two weeks for an Aurora Project residency. The Aurora Project Residency offers a two-week intensive work period for experimentation, research, and development of new and ongoing projects, with priority for the residency given to projects that engage and incorporate the place and people of Indianapolis. The residency includes a $2,000 stipend and a place to stay. This residency takes place in partnership with Tube Factory Art Space Big Car as part of a program for visiting artists working in different genres, staying and working at the Tube Factory campus all year round. Lua Kobayashi received a BA from UCLA in 2019. Her work typically takes its form in photo, video, and installation, often combining all three. Lua is interested in the stories behind everyday objects, places, and people. The artist, who is Japanese-American and Uruguayan, found her heritage and upbringing were different from others of mixed race. She found that she had a very different experience of the world compared to many others. Behind perfection were hidden stories and histories, some more innocent than others. Lua looks at the stories behind the most mundane of places and her heritage to better understand herself and her ancestors. She's spending her two weeks exploring the stories and experiences of Japanese Americans in Indiana through photographs of their belongings and audio interviews. Thank you to Tube Factory Art Space, Big Car, and Listen Here for hosting our talk today. And thanks especially to Lua Kobayashi for this conversation. So welcome. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful to have you here. <laughs> I know you've been super busy since you've been here, and we'll get more into your residency later. But I, thanks for putting this time aside to have the have this talk today. Um, I'd love to start with a simple question uh, that I ask all artists who uh, we interview, and that is, um, how did you get into the arts? Is there somebody in your family, for example, who introduced you to to art as a means of expression? And uh, specifically, how did you get, get into photography? Yeah, so it was a pretty uh, seamless transition growing up for me or sort of a natural path because my dad's an artist and my mom's an architect. And then so I was always very much encouraged to make art and um it's actually funny you talk about how i started photography because i think i was always very naturally inclined and it's funny looking back because i remember i sort of there is a specific trip where i think even my parents pointed out they were like oh, okay photography is kind of the thing for you it was when i went to uruguay and i think i was 10 and i needed to do a report for third grade because i was missing like a week or two of school And so my parents gave me the digital camera and I went all around and I started taking pictures. And there was one photograph I took that was of, I think it was a military suit. And I took it from like a very odd angle that probably I like, it's like you wouldn't think to do that at that age. Like looking back, I I was even impressed by it when I looked at it a couple of weeks. I looked at it, I think a couple of months ago, we found it and I was like, oh, okay. Was it from some kind of an extreme angle, you know, like Bauhaus style? or It was just like from the side. So you could see all the ripples and the clothes and the detail of the buttons. And I was like, I was kind of excited for younger me, but I, so I just kind (laughs) of, I kind of think that, um, I was just very naturally drawn to it. And then growing up, it kind of, um, it always felt like I, I just felt the most comfortable doing art and I really could never see myself doing anything else. And so, yeah, it's the, a passion that's continued. <laughs> yeah. Did uh, So tell me about like, have you had formal studies in photography? Yeah. Uh, at, so I did a lot of photography classes in high school all my weekends were dedicated to taking photography classes at art center 
And then, um, I mean, that was a huge outlet for me at that age because there wasn't anything, I think, at my high school that I think it was more focused like ceramics and painting and drawing. And then when I went to college, um, UCLA had a sort of like a breadth of a program that was like six mediums. And that's sort of how I started combining photography with video was just like the professors I was working with. And then um, I because it was you had to do six um, sort of base studios and then you could sort of select and do four and focus in a little bit more. And I always just continued to do photography that way and then sort of was trained with with those uh, professors in, in that way. Yeah. What kind of things were you looking at uh, during those years that you were in college? Yeah, I th- so in college I took, it took a while for me to, um, <laughs> I, I think in college it took a while for me to uh, sort of reflect and look at myself. And I think like I, I sort of, I'm, I think a lot of people do that. It's a very, I mean, college is always a transformative period. And, and I, what I started to do was I started to look at my own childhood. So I started looking, I think it originally, it sort of started with like storybooks and like Disney movies and looking at that and trying to figure out the influence it had on me and then what like what effect that was and how I had sort of unconsciously adapted those um like different ideals like did like you know what does a Disney princess do and like what's her goal in life and like thinking about that so that was my first couple years and that was really helpful and sort of looking at like growing up in a white suburbia like I always thought one day I was going to wake up and be blonde like that was the hope that I was going to wake up and change my hair color and it didn't happen and then in college is sort of reflecting back on those years and then the last couple i did um i focused in on working and talking about uh claremont which is where i grew up and then sort of learning the stories behind like my neighbors and understanding what kind of community it was and um i built and constructed miniatures of actual places and uh did a lot of research into the history um like uh, different news reports and things like that and reenacted them with these miniature sets and started photographing them and then that sort of turned into a series of installations and so it's just sort of dissecting the dynamics was really something that um you know as something I'm still fascinated with doing but I, that's sort of how it started and um and then sort of now continuing as I'm you know getting older and and past school is sort of looking back as I think the big question after doing that work and focusing on my hometown was the, um, it was again, coming back to me, it sort of felt like I had a bigger, a little bit more of a bigger perspective and, um, looking back and thinking, okay, so like, oh, excuse me, thinking back, um, like what is my, um, heritage and multicultural upbringing and, um, how does that influence me and and my thinking and um yeah and then i became really fascinated and invested in looking into my own family history and understanding that um you know the japanese american side has so much uh, intertwined in uh you know has so much united states history in it and um understanding the effects on that on my family and then sort of the trickle down to me and that so so it all sort of ties together but it does a big round (laughs) It does. I, I want to talk specifically about um, individual series, and I think when you uh, when you were referencing um, that work from college, was that mm-hmm. that became installation work? Mm-hmm. Was that the beginnings of the series, The Rooms? Yeah, yeah, okay. um, and that. I, I, that was definitely one of those, <laughs> it was a COVID attributed project as well, because um, everyone was stuck in homes and spaces and um, I always ask the question, it was a project I always wanted to do because um, when I started doing the miniatures, it was always exteriors and then sort of thinking about lack of access to spaces or, you know, access to spaces because oftentimes um, it was like I, you know, I wasn't like you can't walk up to a stranger's house and can I come inside and that's not something and so I just became very curious and something that I was very drawn to was um like looking into people's 
like, you know, when you drive down your block and you see the lights on inside and you kind of wonder what are people's habits and routines and their house layouts is different from yours and all of those details that people choose to include or not include, the knickknacks and everything's really, um, I mean, that's their world and their safe place and it can tell you a lot about a person. And, and so then in doing the rooms, I was really interested in like how do you represent and reflect that and so then that's how that project came about can you tell us a little bit more about um the the individual uh, works that Mm -hmm. comprise the rooms like it's it's video it's still it's constructed set and are these portraits of the people who uh, who inhabit these rooms Mm -hmm. yeah it was so the it was I'm trying to think back on all of these. I haven't watched them in a little while. (laughs) So they actually all work functionally as um, installation pieces themselves. I do use um, like to like I use green screen and and post effects, but you can actually see them in person um, because they use uh, like as they use it in Disneyland. But uh, Pepper's Ghost, the using 50 percent mirror. 50% 50% glass and I made my own projections to put in there. And so those, so there's a component to those that works as an actual in-room installation that if you walk around, you could see the videos that I have online. So these are full scale. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, um, and then sort of because of the time period where we were all sort of indoors and no one could really see anything, then it developed into doing photographs, which helped as well, because then it's sort of thinking about like tailoring your viewpoint. And I was influenced a lot by um, different movies like Hitchcock and oh, which that. Hitchcock movies? I love Rear Window, oh, yeah. <laughs> which course, makes yeah. sense. As a photographer, yeah. and yeah, just thinking about um, that time and space, and it's it's I think also doing those. It, yeah, it's sort of thinking about it was like putting together a lot of the historical research and also just talking i mean when i started doing those miniatures it was going into neighborhoods and talking to just neighbors on accident because like people see you photographing on the street and i would take partially constructed sets for the first round and take them in public spaces so some of the backdrops of those are real spaces and so people become interested and then they want to have a conversation which is wonderful and then it really opens that up and so and then doing the rooms it's sort of taking those and also a lot of i mean it's experiences from my childhood like there's one that i think is called like the bedroom i think i named it and um it's sort of the time in which a car is passing and someone's pacing around and it's a very like quiet moment and you sort of think about like uh like what is the thought process of someone in that space and like what is it to take time in someone else's personal space and um yeah I was interested to try and include like personal objects as well or sort of like even though it feels like a generic room maybe the layout or something influences objects that were personal to you or objects that were personal to the person who's in the narrative of the image personal to the person who's in the narrative of the image but I also worked some of my own uh personal uh there's a lot of in that one i think of my own fantasy comes into play with the rooms as well because there's sort of a mix of real spaces as well as film spaces because i've always been obsessed with film so then it's sort of taking like a cinematic perspective on somebody's life and then um like in one of them there's a a fish in a photograph which sort of is one of my personal objects and is kind of a funny question (laughs) when you ask someone like or you you go into someone's house and they have pictures of their pets or their kids or something like that so that was so there's little things like that that relate back to me so that one was sort of a play on all the it was like a, a culmination of influences I think of everything that I was working on on that point so this idea this concept of um of rendering a portrait of somebody through their personal objects. Would you say that the rooms are really kind of the start of this idea in your work? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, I, yeah, it's definitely start. Yeah. Cause there's so many, I, I think I like, because you often see people's homes and things like through windows, or you, maybe you go to a friend's house and you get sort of glimpses of what they show you. Um, I, I like love hearing history behind objects and things. And like you said, it was just like a natural, I think, like I'm just a very curious person that way and I really want to know about people and their lives and that project was like 
yeah, I definitely think it was the start of all of that. <laughs> this was the, the beginning that yeah. <laughs> that you really went to in deep to explore in uh, your next major series, right? Mm -hmm. That um, that would be the, uh, where a forest once grew, mm -hmm. and um, that's uh, about your grandmother mm -hmm. and her history and the history of your family. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us how you moved from uh, the rooms uh, into this new series, Where a Forest Once Grew? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, so that project uh, was, you know, I feel very lucky. It was with working with a grant, um, the UCLA Artani grant, and the um, UCLA Asian Studies Department were uh, contributing to that. And so um, I really wanted to do sort of something an homage to my heritage and I don't think I, I knew what that was I just started researching and um exploring you know what you know what does that mean for me and then um yeah I th I'm trying to think too the I mean going from the rooms to that one I think the thing was is as much as I love miniatures and I love miniature spaces I, w I think I was ready to see what I could do um that was maybe different or sort of a more uh just exploring beyond that but keeping the same ideas um and that one that project came about um when my so i wasn't sure what i was going to do i was left with this huge um archive of family photographs of my grandmother when she was a baby to when she was my age and to when she was a mother and it was pretty amazing to be able to piece together her life and it felt like a similar process as to building and and thinking about the miniatures because it's it, i always feel like i i like get clues or get bits and pieces of things and try and piece together people's lives because there's just so much information and things that are said or unsaid and for my grandmother i sort of realized it's like i knew one version of her as grandma and then I started to learn about her in these photographs as like a young woman and as a mother and like what her like what her real life was. And um, and then she passed away in 2021. And so then the process of my whole family has come together and we still have to sort of go through her house. Um, and as a lot of memories came up and it was very. I, I was really fascinated, I think, in, in how much something very small or simple could really like conjure such strong memories and feelings for everyone. And I got to know and learn a lot about my grandmother through um, like my dad's point of view, my aunt's point of view, my uncle's point of view, my mom and, and everybody's like growing, you know, their relationship with her. And so then I was sort of naturally, I started photographing all of her belongings because sometimes people, sometimes people didn't want it, but I thought it needed to be um, commemorated. Like the last lipstick she wore, like that felt really important because it's something that isn't going to be there forever. And um, it's like going through a house is like a very hefty process. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was... Um, you know, and you, and you can't, unfortunately you can't keep everything as much as you'd like to. So there was a lot, it started out that way too, of just sort of commemorating and then also photographing the house itself. And then, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sh I know there's, there's plenty of belongings that I still want to photograph of hers. Like we have a cedar chest that I, we're pretty sure has her wedding dress in it and one of her kimonos in it. And, um, I really want to open that up, <laughs> but you're um, just waiting for the right time to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately no one has the key. So okay. that kind of makes it a little difficult. <laughs> takes a little longer without the key. Yeah. Well, good luck on finding the key. But Thank you. Uh, can you tell me, uh, what did you and your family learn about mm -hmm. your grandmother's history and her life through your work? Yeah. So, um, I learned, I actually, so it, it sort of vacillates between also the photographs informing my understanding of her and the objects. Um, and so I combed through as many photo archives as I could, like across the United States and started to search her name and, and her maiden name was Fujimoto. Um, so it's like looking up Ruth Fujimoto and everything. And I found photo photos of her, um, pre 
um, the internment camp when she, when they had to, they had a family plant nursery and then they started, there's like staged photographs of my grandmother selling off plants to people and they were included in some magazine. And I had, it's kind of funny because I had no idea about that they took photos like this and that there were, you know, that they were published somewhere. And she modeled for them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a weird, <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to photograph for as well. And I mean, cause then it was sort of thinking, um, realizing that, you know, she played a part in history that like people saw this and like it became history. And then, um, so in looking through her belongings, we found, I found this, it was neatly tucked away. It was this bank, um, note, which I think had all of her, like the money she made, um, at the, I think during the internment camp, she, she was 13 or 14. And then I, when I was also pulling it out, there were diary entries of her, um, at that age and like writing down, I think like a couple days before she left for camp. And so that gave a big insight into like what she was thinking before she left. And, uh, I mean, I found it fascinating as well that she decided to keep them and keep them in such a like little space, but, um, I learned that, you know, they had a piano and that they were, they had to sell it. And, um, emotionally it kind of, I mean, things that we had never really heard because sometimes in Japanese American families, it's not as talked about as much. And I was also too young to really ask before my grandmother, she had, um, Alzheimer's. So we couldn't, I, I couldn't ask her as many as I wanted to. And so, um, it was, I mean, it was interesting to like hear her at that age and, and like listen to her voice and her talk about how she was feeling. And then, so that was, that was one of the big landmarks we found. And then after camp, it was my grandmother's young woman. There's photographs of her in Chicago, which is how I started thinking about the project for Aurora. And then... Yeah. Yeah. And so then, um, the, there's sort of a blank spot in there too. Cause I didn't realize, and then talking to my family said, Oh yeah, they lived in a house in the suburbs for a bit before they moved back to California. And then uh, the other really exciting thing that I loved finding out was my grandmother was a Nisei week princess in little Tokyo, which is sort of like a pageant and which makes a lot of sense with the grandmother I knew cause she always wore lipstick and was always did her hair and, you know, um, very much cared about her appearance and things. And her dresses were always, um, when she was a mother, she always had very tailored dresses according to my family. And so then realizing, oh, she was a Nisei week princess and what did this mean? And that led down a whole rabbit hole of getting in contact with different archives and finding photographs of her, um, like doing like the swimsuit pageant and wearing her kimono. And, um, yeah, I think she was my age when she did it. And so I, it was, it was like a beautiful full circle moment and then finding, um, finding that was pretty amazing. Um, I can imagine. My yeah. goodness. I'm wondering, um, so the personality, you know, this glamour and the fact that she was forward facing, you know, she was a model that mm-hmm. she was the princess and did the pageant work and everything. Did mm-hmm. that influence the aesthetics when you went to actually make these photographs of her objects? Cause I'm thinking, you know, like these gorgeous images that you made of mm-hmm. her, um, of her, uh, paper, her books, her gloves, her mm-hmm. lipstick, um, there's glamour and um, sophistication in the actual objects, many of them, mm-hmm. but also the way that you photograph them, you know, against a, a beautiful lush black background and with a, a certain type of lighting that just makes these objects glimmer. Is that an ode to your grandmother's personality or, you know, where did that uh, the aesthetic for these images come in then? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I kind of think that came, it sort of came naturally with the objects, because those were all the things that she kept. And I think they all very, I mean, they're all very naturally, I think all had that. So I felt, I think I was very lucky in that sense because they're all beautiful, colorful, um, very like just very rich feeling things. And, um, yeah, I think, yeah, it felt like each object was very special and it needed its own moment. I think it felt like when I was putting that 
project together. So right, the, yeah. the images in Where a Forest Once Grew, they definitely transcend like you know description or documentary you know, images of the objects. They're definitely um, heading into uh, ter- an homage territory, mm-hmm. and they are quite beautiful. And it, your work with Where a Forest Once Grew it culminated in an, uh, an important installation. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and the, that installation too. It was. I felt very lucky. I worked with, um, again, it was that grant as well as, um, the Westwood village association was, they were very, very kind in helping me find the perfect space. And, um, yeah, it felt like the right space as well because she had such glamorous items. There was also the question of what it would it be like to see them in a sort of a storefront location as well because they felt a little bit like, uh, I think I had a friend tell me it felt a little bit like a department store, which is, I felt like an interesting part to add to the conversation, like with the sort of like the glamour of those looking of those items. And But it's, it's funny too because it's like some of them are, just feel so common, like her comb and things like that. And so, yeah. And just trying to give, I mean, that was a really special thing because I loved the opportunity to be able to make it, um, an immersive space and something that people could really, um, I mean, hopefully they enjoyed walking through and taking their time with each of the pieces and, um, yeah. And they could also learn the history behind them with some, I had written everything down on my website as well, so they could have the sort of dual experience, whatever they desired. Excellent. Um, and you mentioned that your grandmother's personal experience of the time that she spent in Chicago Mm -hmm. gave you this idea of maybe extending your research Mm -hmm. about, uh, Japanese American lives and experiences through their objects, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to encompass, uh, Midwestern states and specifically that's why you were interested in maybe coming out to Indianapolis mm-hmm. through the residency yeah. and photographing out here. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder like as you prepared to apply for this residency, uh, how common was it for, um, Japanese Americans to m- move from California out to the Midwest or even farther mm-hmm. East, you know, af- especially after experience in the camps? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm probably not the ideal person or expert to talk about this. I've talked with some really wonderful people and out here and, and have learned a, a lot more through um, someone I, I talked to, Nancy Connor. She wrote papers as well and conducted audio interviews um, long before, you know, I think I conceived this project as well. And um, and she talks about those experiences and it sounds like from uh, from her and her paper, um, that it was, it, I think it just depended on where you were moving and there's different congregations. Like I believe, um, there's a larger group of Japanese Americans in Ch- that stayed in Chicago and then dispersal. Um, it just sounded like it was, uh, it, it just sounded like it varied from state to state. And I think that's why I was really interested in doing this project because, um, I, I've, I mean, I grew up going to like uh, places like little Tokyo and, um, with that kind of, that kind of representation. And I was just curious as to what form does that take out in the Midwest and, you know, what does that look like? And, um, the big question was just like, what does life look like out in the Midwest and how did people establish themselves? And I just had a lot of questions and again, was just very curious about it. And that was, um, this, I mean, this is a project I would love to continue doing. So I feel very lucky to have started it here. And like, I want to keep coming back out and talking to people and learning more. Cause it's, it's just, inc- I mean, it's amazing that the variety and, um, you know, people have been so kind and to, to talk to me and share everything with me. So, yeah. It's- well, we're thrilled that, that we could be, um, a, a starting point for this phase of your research. Mm-hmm. I know getting here, you know, um, as you prepared for the residency preparation, it was really key because, you know, you're only here for two weeks and you Mm -hmm. wanted to, uh, to be able to interview and meet as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, make the most of your time while you're out here. Uh, how did, how did you make those connections? Did you have some (laughs) people who helped you out with that? Yeah. So, uh, Japanese American citizens league out here, again, Nancy Connor was really wonderful and she, 
uh, helped, worked with me and helped me to make sort of a one page call out to people who wanted to participate. And through um, the Japan Society of Indiana, um, they with a few members on there as well. They helped me get connected with um, individuals like Kathy Foley, who have been kind enough to continue to um, refer me and um, you know share my call with people and, and invite me into their homes to have people. So it was, I mean, it was really, I was a little nervous starting it, but then people were so kind with open arms and have really taken the time to spread the word. So it's been incredible. Well, I know you're probably still processing, you know, mentally all mm -hmm. the interviews and, and you probably still have to process the images that you made out <laughs> here. Uh, but uh, any initial impressions, any interviews or interactions, photos that you've made out here mm -hmm. that um, you, are, you feel especially compelled by? Yeah. Um, you know, it's just been incredible. I think the thing is um, how are keep people keeping and representing their Japanese heritage. And so people have been very kind to share with me, you know, like picnic boxes that their families have kept or um, sort of hashi or chopstick holders as well. I got some of those. And um, there was a gentleman who also received belongings from his neighbor and they're this uh, person's childhood kimonos and things and the accessories that went along with it that he plans to give with his granddaughter that I really loved uh, sort of the cross culture that happens here I think that's really exciting to meet so many people that have uh, you know like multicultural backgrounds here as well and and like I growing up it was being mixed with my my younger sister we were sort of the only ones that were um, half Japanese and then you know coming out here I noticed there's a lot of half Japanese people and getting to meet with them and talk with them and um has I that's I mean I found it really exciting and really special that they were sharing their experiences of growing up here with me and yeah I I've, I've loved hearing about it and it's a completely different experience from California as well it's like Indiana's just a completely different landscape for me so understanding that and seeing how um everybody's lived here has been amazing that's incredible, and I can't wait to, uh, until you make those um, mm -hmm. interviews and uh, photographs public. Mm -hmm. um, it must be kind of um, enervating to walk into homes and spaces where you've never been before, mm -hmm. and you know that there are going to be these really uh, incredible objects that are going to be important to your projects, but you don't really have too much control over the yeah. physical uh, layout of the place or mm -hmm. the lighting, you know, the things yeah. that contribute to making a photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, how has that been? <laughs> you know, are you just kind of uh, resigned to letting fate take its course with some of these objects that you're trying to photograph, which, I, mm -hmm. as I understand, some of them are quite large. Yeah. Lots of challenges there to actually <laughs> make the images. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I've just been taking it in stride because it's, again, I, I would feel really do feel I can't thank all these people enough who have been really kind enough to let me in and I have uh, some camera equipment that I bring and a light and a tripod and they're very patient with me and sharing their objects and the stories behind them while I'm unpacking and photographing <laughs> and the beauty of photoshop too is later you can make them all match so it's oh uh, yeah and so I just um yeah I I just really have it's yeah I just figure on the go and um, and I think there's something really beautiful as well. Like I, you know, people also give me sort of have been kind enough to give me space in their homes as well to photograph. And, um, I kind of love the, the, some of them have different backgrounds and, um, different textures and things, but it's all, um, to that person's home and, and it's all to that person's personality and, um, how they're choosing to share these objects with me. So I, I figure that all sort of plays into the story and it's all something I really want to capture because I think also being out here for two weeks, it feels, it's sort of, I'm, my mentality is I want to take a picture of everything and everybody and all of that to really, um, you know, cause it's like to try and get, I think like, you know, someone's whole life story is so difficult in such a short amount of time. And, um, so yeah, I just, uh, it's just, I feel, I'm just excited by all of it. It's kind of, it's like, I'll just I go into the houses. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
You've been focusing mostly on uh, on older generation mm-hmm. stories and, and people while you've been here. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it seems like there's a sense of urgency about that uh, to record these stories, to mm-hmm. make this work while, um, while the time is right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think... Um, so there's in sort of Japanese American, there's different generations. And so I believe I'm, I think they call it, I'm Yonsei and then my father and would be Sansei. And then before that is Nisei. And so the Nisei generation who a lot of them were in the internment camps are starting to pass away. And so, uh, again, like my grandmother was in her like young teens and sort of understanding that that's the age range that, that's leaving or and, and passing on. Um, but I was lucky enough to speak with a couple individuals now that, that were in, in that camp and understanding uh, what their families went through. Um, and yeah, I do, it's very important to capture those stories. And um, I there's a lot a lot of them out here, like Jean Mamura, who's uh, has given lectures and things like at the Idol Jorg and. Um, being able to hear her story and ask her questions has been really amazing and very special to hear, um, just sort of be able to ask her about what that was like. And I, again, just moving from Indiana, cause she had a similar background of going from, uh, the West coast, she was in Seattle and then moving out here. So that was really amazing to hear. And then also then the generation after that Sansei generation, um, finding, you know, what, like, what is that culture like out here? And, and like, how have, how have they lived their lives? What kind of jobs do they have houses and things is, I mean, that's all really fascinating to me. And, um, you know, it's like my cousin, I have a cousin of mine who we're both, um, and another, another older cousin, uncle who are, we're very, um, fascinated with our family history and preserving it and through them as well and talking in conversations with them we kind of realized that even the small things that we might not be interested or might not think are important like just day-to-day life things it's like maybe our kids are going to want to hear about that and so um i i've just really loved being able to come out here and have conversations as well with that generation to understand their perspective and um you know and like to get a glimpse of what you know what their what their thoughts are and um their experience and how they keep their japanese traditions alive and continue that so that's been very special to do and um talking with all of them and i i love multi-generational conversations as well and those are very special to hear everyone talk with like their parents and i love i love that (laughs) Always interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'll be excited to hear um, after you've had some chance to be with the images and the the interviews that you've made out here uh, uh, to hear the the differences between the experiences Mm -hmm. of, you know, California and Midwest, specifically here in Mm -hmm. the Indianapolis area. Yeah. So we'll look forward to seeing that. Uh, you've gotten so much done already, uh, and you're about you're a little bit over halfway done with your <laughs> with your residency. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I know this is like the the third residency that you've done yes. and as an emerging artist. That's mm-hmm. kind of uh, incredible that you've had three <laughs> important residencies uh, already in your career. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd like for you to, if you can, to talk a little bit about the yeah. place of residency in your work mm-hmm. and your workflow and, and how you see that influencing what you do in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually, I mean, I th- th- I've been reflecting on um, how residencies, I think, how have, have affected me and my perspective. And I feel so lucky to have, I don't know, people believe in me and believe in my work and like, you know, be excited and trust me enough to invite me into spaces. Like I just, I feel very fortunate and, um, I, I love it. I think, um, I, I think so, like I, it's, so it's like when I was starting out, I think place is so important and incredibly influential. And I, I think, um, like being able to go somewhere and immerse yourself into like as much as you can soak up in that amount of time is like my favorite thing ever. And I think there's nuances and things that you don't expect or that you, you like the things like your routine during that period of time might be very different. And the things that you see that might be normal for everyone else is like, you know, new to you. And, um, yeah, I loved, I, I just 
love being able to just soak it all in and I just try and blend in wherever I am to try and get the <laughs> like authentic experience and um I have to ask you specifically yeah. about the uh, the camera obscura art lab the, oh, the coal yeah. residency mm -hmm. that you did in Santa Monica mm -hmm. for people who don't know about the camera obscura out there can you oh, uh, yeah. explain what that is and and what you, you did during the residency because it sounds like it's a perfect example of how uh, the, the work came to integrate the place so closely yeah that was I I loved that residency it was like absolutely incredible and I grew up going to Santa Monica, so I have a very like fond relationship with it. It's like my teen years were going out there and hanging out with friends. And then when the residency came up, I really, really wanted to apply and just to be in Santa Monica. Yeah, because it's just <laughs> I mean, the studio they have is beautiful. And then the camera obscura itself. I went to when I was younger. And um, if you haven't been in that room, it's a big, dark room, but you can uh, spin. They have a little. Uh, sort of like a captain's boat wheel in there that you can spin around to look at the landscape. And I spent a lot of time in there. This residency was a couple months. And so um, I spent as much time as I could out there and just spent a lot of time on the beach and a similar process to what I'm doing here as well, talking to people, um, going to historical societies and just doing as much. I love reading sort of first person accounts and things and um, I got in contact with the Santa Monica Historical Society and the Japanese American National Museum. And there were some wonderful archivists there who sort of helped me um, because as I started this project, I became uh, it was I was doing it at the same time I was doing the work about my grandmother. So it was a lot of questions about my heritage. And so doing the Santa Monica project, I sort of wondered, OK, like I know that there's a lot of Japanese Americans in Santa Monica and I have family members who grew up in that area. And I kind of thought, OK, you know, what was that like? How long has the history been there? And it's just just like a simple question that revealed that there was actually a um, hidden like Japanese fishing village at the turn of the like turn of the 1900s. And um, I found as many photographs as I could. There was very few and um, found a couple, I believe there were some letters I found as well, sort of describing what it was like. And then unfortunately, like with time, and I believe there was a, it was some sort of construction issue as well. It sort of disappeared with time. But um, it, I, from my understanding, it influenced the um, like fishing in the community and they were starting on the shore of Pacific Palisades. And so I just became really invested in doing that. And I, it sort of became like a step-by-step. -step. So I was really in love with the camera obscura itself and really in love with this history and thought, okay, I built my own camera obscura and used a GoPro and took out this clunky big <laughs> wood piece and started to film the landscape and then created a, um, sort of an immersive installation that combines what you would actually see through the camera obscura with historical photographs that have been animated. And um, then there's fish that come in and it becomes a, a bit more spiritual. But it, I, yeah, I loved going in and be able to do dive head first into the history. And I, I think also I spent time as well, just sort of sitting on those beaches and looking at the landscape and just trying to see what people do now and you know how has it changed through time and um yeah i think like history for me just feels so important because it's just even if you're looking at one section it's like you need to understand how it was influenced by everything and everybody else and of course it's like i only get like a breath and there's um you know lots and lots more reading i could do, you know that is out there and very detailed and i try and read as much as i can to understand and um but yeah it was such a beautiful history that it felt like no one really knew about or talked about and um that one was a lot of fun too because i also um was able to go on a boat and film as well <laughs> with this big camera that oh that was a lot of fun because the other idea too is um try and think about what did those fishermen see what was the landscape going to look like from the ocean versus the land and to try and again it was one of those really immerse myself into that past and understanding trying to understand 
And all of that research became the Shoro Nagashi to the village that once was. Mm -hmm. And that series is also on your website. Yeah, yeah. That Mm -hmm. whole video piece is on my website. And um, yeah, I felt that was a really, um, it went through, I think, a couple different rounds as well to figure out what was going to be. And like I said, I fell in love with the camera obscura. So to be able to... Um, I, you know, to put a projection in there and I'm uh, hoping that, um, you know, it'll be something I can share in the big scale or in a larger scale, um, with people. Um, but yeah, I hope the camera obscura is also, I think they're hopefully going to open it, reopen it again soon. Cause it is such a special thing in Santa Monica that it gives you such a unique perspective and just to people watch. I did that cause I, I loved doing that and just seeing how it changed throughout the day. And, um, I was there in sort of the height of summer. So I could sort of see like when kids would come in, when families would come in and, you know, when it was less crowded and just how places changed throughout, throughout the seasons and throughout the day. And I mean, that also influences it all too, because your understanding of how a place and space is used is, is really informative and I think whether I was actively um, acknowledging it at the time, I think I think it all worked its way in. <laughs> yeah, I know the landscape has been calling to you uh, also out here in Indiana. Yeah. You mentioned that you, you're sort of tempted to maybe investigate a little bit of filming of the landscape mm-hmm. while you're out here too. So yeah. that seems like something that's kind of always running in the background in your mm-hmm. project. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, because it's so, I mean, out here, it's everyone keeps telling me, isn't it so flat? And I, um, my focus is I can't believe how green it is out here. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. So. Yeah, you came at the right time of year, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, ve- very good. Very good. Um, the uh, next phase, of what's what's next for you? Like after you leave us, um, are you going back to California or do you have plans for exhibition uh, later in the year or going um, forward? I don't have any current ones right now, but, um, you know, I just am taking this project and I mean, this has just been a load of information and research and photographs, which has been amazing. And it always takes me yes, a little while. Yes, you have to... even more work when you get home. Right. <laughs> get through all of it, sift through all of it. Yeah. Yeah, which is, it's like going through and figuring out, um, you know, everything. And again, being here, it's like, I, I'm going to have, it's going to be a time of reflection, I definitely think. And then to really dive head first into uh, fully realizing this project that I'm really excited about. And seeing creating its final form, I think, is going to be the the mission when I get back. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, in addition to your your artwork, you also teach, and mm-hmm. you're involved with the Las Photos project as well. Right? Yeah, I was a mentor for them for a bit of time, and they were they're such an amazing organization in LA, and they help um, they help girls in downtown LA get access to camera equipment and. Um, give them classes and space and time to be able to create photographs and learn what the field is all about. And so I loved it. I thought, you know, I loved being a mentor to the girls I was mentored to mentor mentoring. They were lovely. And, um, I, when it, funny enough, one of them actually went to UCLA after. And so it was, it's just, I mean, it's amazing. It's like, I love watching them grow. And I do think as well that teaching is sort of um, influenced my thinking as well. And to be less, um, I think like to open my, like to be willing to try and experiment more because sort of seeing people at the start of their careers and the start of their curiosity, it's just, it's so exciting. It's like, Oh, I never thought of doing that. It's like, or to go into it with a full, to just be ready to explore and to try everything and just dive head first to, and watching them experiment and try different forms of photographing is, I mean, it's amazing. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Yeah, and thank again, you. thank you so much for your time and thank you to our hosts, big factory arts, uh, art space, big car and listen here. Um, we hope to see your new work on your website. Can you tell us about your website one more time? Yeah. Um, I th- it's Luokobayashi.com. It's Luokobayashi.com. <laughs> <laughs> I kept it very simple. Straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> and 
we'll keep an eye on that for your uh, for your newest work and especially from your work from Indianapolis. Thanks again, Lua. Thank you so much for everything. So thank you. It's been such a pleasure.